William Lloyd Garrison felt that he was destined to do great things, but he had no idea how to get there. In 1828, he was 22 years old, newly arrived in the city from his hometown of Newburyport. William Lloyd Garrison's religious background was not just a background. It was at the core of who he was. It was an indwelling spirit inside of him that constantly thought about making God's will come into being on this earth. Shortly after arriving in Boston, Garrison happened to meet an itinerant publisher who was raising money for his one-man anti-slavery newspaper. Garrison was horrified by descriptions of the slave pens where men, women, and children were held awaiting shipment further south. And he began to think that ending slavery was the cause that could give meaning to his life. Garrison was making powerful enemies. Within months, he was thrown in prison for vilifying a slave trader. A New York sympathizer bailed him out in the spring of 1830. He had no job to return to. Neither did he have a home or a family. He had few friends or allies. He did, however, have a plan, a newspaper of his own to promote immediate abolition. I am willing to be persecuted imprisoned and bound for advocating African rights, and I should deserve to be a slave myself if I shrunk from that duty or danger. By the fall of 1830, William Lloyd Garrison was back in Boston, doggedly pursuing his dream of an abolitionist newspaper. He scrounged around for printing supplies and convinced a colleague to loan him a few reams of paper. He traveled around the Northeast gathering a handful of allies among white reformers, but not enough to support his venture. On January 1st, 1831, Garrison's long-awaited day arrived. On the first page of the first issue of his newspaper, Garrison declared, there shall be no neutrals. Men shall either like or dislike me. Let Southern oppressors tremble. Let their Northern apologists tremble. Let all the enemies of the persecuted blacks tremble. On the subject of slavery, I do not wish to write with moderation. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. For eight months, Garrison toiled away in almost complete obscurity. Then, an explosion of violence halfway across the country suddenly propelled him to national prominence. On a hot August night in 1831, a band of armed slaves rode through the Virginia countryside, killing the white occupants of one farmhouse after another. Nat Turner, the man who led the rebellion, would elude a massive search party for 68 days before he too was caught and executed. There's no evidence that Garrison's liberator had any influence on Nat Turner, but very quickly in the Southern press, Garrison's name started to be associated with Nat Turner's revolt. The South Carolina legislature put a bounty on Garrison's head. $15,000 if he could deliver his body. Uh, I think more if he delivered the whole man alive. Garrison welcomed the notoriety. The Liberator is causing extraordinary agitation among whites in the slave states. I am constantly receiving anonymous letters filled with abominable and bloody sentiments. These trouble me less than the wind. I was never so happy and confident as I am at the present time. Over the next two years, Garrison gradually won adherence to the anti-slavery cause. Almost 50 abolitionist groups formed in 10 states. In 1833, two years after William Lloyd Garrison launched the Liberator, abolitionists from all over the North gathered for the first time they could feel the strength of their growing numbers. The time had come to unify their far-flung groups into one national anti-slavery society. 
Garrison was chosen to draw up the organization's charter. He worked through the night, producing a radical document that crystallized his own beliefs, especially his faith in the power of nonviolence. Our measures shall be the opposition of moral purity to moral corruption, the destruction of error by the potency of truth, the overthrow of prejudice by the power of love, and the abolition of slavery by the spirit of repentance. The American Anti-Slavery Society came to life the next day when 63 people signed Garrison's manifesto. They vowed to spread the anti-slavery gospel to every city, town, and village, and they agreed to use what they called moral suasion to convert slaveholders to the cause. By 1835, two years after the formation of the American Anti-Slavery Society, there were over 300 chapters throughout the free states with tens of thousands of members. Garrison and New York businessman Louis Tappan hoped to build on this momentum with a bold plan to directly confront Southern slaveholders and their supporters. They proposed printing 20 to 50,000 pamphlets a week and mailing them to ministers, politicians, and newspaper editors in each state, especially in the South. The postal campaign became a phenomenon. Within a year, the Anti-Slavery Society had flooded the nation with over a million pieces of abolitionist literature, along with medals, emblems, bandanas, chocolate wrappers, songs, and readers for small children. The Great Postal Campaign did not bring about the end of what Southerners called our peculiar institution. Instead, it triggered a wave of repression throughout the slave states. In Charleston, 3,000 people destroyed anti-slavery materials and then burned garrison in effigy. The vehemence of the reaction in the South took the abolitionists by surprise. But they were even more alarmed when the violence moved north. In some cases, abolitionists themselves were the targets, as when a New York mob burned Lewis Tappan's house to the ground. But all too often, African Americans were the victims of racist violence, from isolated beatings to the expulsion of entire black communities. The mobs shattered every abolitionist assumption that righteousness would triumph over evil, that their fellow Americans would listen to reason, that their northern neighbors would support the abolitionist cause. Garrison and his fellow abolitionists had roused an enemy far more tenacious, entrenched, and violent than they had ever imagined. By the fall of 1835, anti-abolitionist violence was closing in on Boston. A stone-throwing crowd had recently forced one of Garrison's allies to abandon a speech. Garrison himself woke one morning to find a gallows on his front lawn. He ignored the warnings. On the morning of October 21st, 1835, he made his way across town to deliver yet another anti-slavery lecture. Fortunately for Garrison, Two burly men in the crowd took pity on him and rushed him to the town hall. With the mob still calling for Garrison's blood, the mayor put the terrified printer in jail for the night for his own protection. He had been shaken to his core, his faith in his fellow men poisoned, his hope for his country undermined. Garrison begins to suspect that every part of American society is infected by a deep moral disease. And he starts to say, the churches are pro-slavery. We're coming out of all the churches. Politics are, are pro-slavery. Abolitionists should never vote. It becomes far more radical and far more anti-institutional. By 1840, after 10 years of struggle, William Lloyd Garrison was drifting away from many of his old allies, alienating them with what they considered irrelevant heresies 
Rather than backing down, Garrison upped the ante. Because the Constitution itself was corrupt, he charged, the Union was fatally flawed. Garrison insisted that abolitionists renounce their government, that they withdraw from citizenship and refuse to vote. Many of Garrison's old friends had had enough. Some of them had been deeply offended by his support of women's rights. Others thought it lunacy for a reform movement to ignore politics or to insist that supporters refrain from voting. And a few were quietly wondering whether nonviolence could ever free the slaves. In May of 1840, they quit the American Anti-Slavery Society. The organization remained with Garrison at its head, but membership and income plummeted. The infighting left the abolition movement fragmented and disheartened. Many wondered whether it would disappear altogether. Time and again, Garrison, Grimke, Weld, and their kindred spirits had sounded the warning. The Republic couldn't forever encompass the ideal of liberty and the reality of slavery. For their beliefs, they had been reviled, mocked, beaten, and imprisoned. But they had exposed the fatal weakness in the Union and set the nation on course to the gravest crisis in its history was the Fugitive Slave Law. The law stipulated that any citizen, North or South, could be rounded up and forced to catch a suspected runaway. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 virtually legitimates the kidnapping of free blacks. It means that a Southerner can hunt down any black in free soil and say, you're my slave. And most uh, significantly in one sense, any white can be deputized at any moment, day or night, and is required to help uh, round up a suspected fugitive slave. When the compromise was finally sealed in late September, abolitionists were horrified. 20 years of struggle had yielded not emancipation, but a million more slaves, and a political agreement to preserve the institution in the United States forever. The petitions, the campaigns, the rallies, the marches, the meetings and resolutions and fundraisers, the mobs, the beatings, all of the sacrifices had been suddenly dealt away by a handful of men in Washington. As a final insult, abolitionists were cast as villains who had almost torn the nation apart. The New York Globe urged that no public building not even the streets must be desecrated by such a gathering of traitors. It became dangerous once again to speak out against slavery. What the country just said from the heart of the government is that slavery is forever. This radicalizes the anti-slavery movement arguably more than anything that had ever happened before. The crisis convinced Garrison that he needed to redouble his efforts. From Boston, he directed an energetic campaign of meetings, petitions, and publicity. But for many abolitionists, Garrison's old tactics seemed hopelessly inadequate. Frederick Douglass, for one, had begun to question his own faith in a peaceful end to slavery and in American democracy itself. Your boasted liberty is an unholy license. Your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns are fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There's not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than all the people of the United States. The role that abolitionists played in the build-up to the Civil War was absolutely crucial. Without the abolitionists, I think there's, one could say that slave owners would have turned the entire United States into slave country. Garrison, like everybody, like Douglas, like all the people that have been in tremendous conflict with each other uh, before the war, are in a sense reunited 
in the war for the Union. At last, the squabbling abolitionist factions came together again, including, above all, Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison. Whatever political or personal differences have divided us, Douglas wrote, a common goal makes us forget those differences and strike at the common foe. When Garrison is forced to choose, he chooses abolition over his peace principles. For almost four decades, Garrison had dedicated his life to this moment. He had created a movement, had led it through every adversity without wavering. The Liberator, had become not only the most influential voice of abolition, but the symbol of its tenacity. 1,803 issues, every one set by hand, most by Garrison's own. And this, Garrison felt, was a fitting occasion to print the last. The post-war years would be hard. Garrison, Douglas, and their kindred spirits protested in vain as Northern and Southern whites conspired to keep the emancipated slaves in a condition almost indistinguishable from slavery. But nothing could entirely erase the change that had taken place in American life. The abolitionists of this country were never a numerous class, but lately death has been busy in reducing their already thin ranks. Only a few can now tell from actual experience something of the darkness and peril that brooded over the land when the anti-slavery movement was born. Now the brightest and steadiest of all the shining hosts of our moral sky has silently and peacefully descended below the distant horizon. He moved not with the tide, but against it, he rose not by the power of the church or the state, but in bold, inflexible, and defiant opposition to the mighty power of both. It was the glory of this man that he could stand alone with the truth and calmly await the result. Now that this man has filled up the measure of his years, now that the leaf has fallen to the ground as all leaves must fall, let us guard his memory let us try to imitate his virtues and endeavor, as he did, to leave the world freer, nobler, and better than we found it. <laughs>